I'm not a huge fan of ORMs. In fact, I'm kind of an ORM hater. But recently I used a new ORM that I actually didn't hate. In fact, I kind of liked it. The ORM I'm talking about is called Drizzle, and it's a TypeScript ORM that works with relational databases like Postgres, MySQL, and SQLite. Okay, so why do I typically hate ORMs, and what is it about Drizzle that sets it apart from most ORMs? Well, I'll answer this in a moment, but first I've got a message from the sponsor of this video, which is me. You see, it's currently the summer of 2024, and I recently was laid off from my startup job, and I'm looking for a new job. So if you know of any developer jobs that you think I might be a good fit for, please reach out to me. I'd love to chat. Okay, let's get back to the video. So why do I typically hate ORMs? Well, I've been a developer for over 20 years, and I've worked with a lot of different ORMs, and the thing that bothers me most about them is that I already know how to talk to a database. In other words, I know SQL very well, but with most ORMs, I can't use my SQL knowledge. I have to learn a new language, the ORMs language, which inevitably becomes a source of frustration for me. Now, to be clear, if you follow the happy path with ORMs, they can seem pretty great, but as soon as you need to do something that's not on the happy path, things can get really frustrating really fast. And for somebody like myself, who is very good at SQL, it often feels like the ORM is just not worth it. Okay, so full disclosure, I've actually tried to ditch ORMs in the past, and when I did, a funny thing happened. I eventually found myself kind of re-implementing an ORM, and that's when I came to realize that you can't really escape ORMs. You either use an existing one, or you end up building your own. So I think that ORMs are pretty much unavoidable, so the question I'm left with is, why can't ORMs be a little bit better and a little less frustrating to somebody like myself, a SQL fan? Okay, so what does a little bit better and a little bit less frustrating mean to me? Well, I want an ORM that leans into SQL rather than trying to hide it. Why? Because SQL is a powerful language that I already know, and so if the ORM works like SQL, then there's a smaller learning curve, and I can write the complex queries that I need to write without having to fight the ORM or just give up and write raw SQL. So why do I like Drizzle? Well, you could probably guess at this point. Drizzle is an ORM that leans into SQL and embraces it, so you get all the benefits of an ORM without having to learn a new language and without having to fight the ORM when you need to write complex queries. Okay, so what's Drizzle like to use? Well, let me show you. So I created this little project that I set up just for the purpose of demonstrating Drizzle. Let me walk you through what I've got here. First of all, let's take a quick look at our package.json file. Now the interesting dependencies here are Drizzle ORM, Postgres, which is the database we'll be using in this video, then we've got this DrizzleKit dev dependency here. So what's DrizzleKit? Well, it's a command line tool that is a companion to Drizzle, and it's primarily used for SQL migrations. You can see how I'm using DrizzleKit here in the script section of the package.json file. So I've got this generate script here, which will generate the migration SQL file. Then I've got this migrate script here, which will run the migrations. Okay, you're probably wondering, how does Drizzle know what migrations to generate? Well, to understand this, we'll first look at this Drizzle config file here. So basically we're importing this define config function here, then we're calling it here, and we're passing in this configuration object. The dialect property is set to Postgres, which is the database we're using, and then we've got this schema property here that points to this schema file that we'll look at in just a moment. Lastly, we've got this DB credentials property here, which contains the database connection information. Let's go take a look at the schema.ts file that's referenced here. So this file represents the single source of truth for our database schema. In other words, this file is where we define our tables and our columns and indexes and so on. Then the application uses these definitions to generate the SQL migrations, and it also defines the TypeScript types that represents the tables and columns. We see two tables in our schema file, a customer table here and an orders table here. Now, if you know SQL's data definition language, then this schema file should feel pretty familiar to you. Let's take a closer look at this customer schema definition. First, we see a call to the pgtable function. The first parameter passed into pgtable is the name of the table in the database, and the second parameter is an object that defines the columns of the table we're creating. And the first column we see is the ID column. Its type is a serial type, which is a type that auto-increments, and it's the primary key of the customer's table. 
Next we see the name column, which is a text type, and it's required. Then we see the email column, which is also a text type. It's required and it must be unique. Lastly we see a couple of meta columns, created at and updated at, which default to the current time. The next table is the orders table, and its schema definition is pretty similar to the customers table. The only interesting part of the orders table is that it has a customer ID column, which is a foreign key that references the ID column of the customers table. Now there's a third parameter to the PG table function, where we're passing in this function here. This function is used to define the indexes of the table. So in this example, we're defining an index on the customer ID column, which is a foreign key. Next we see a couple of optional relationships that we're defining. We see that the customer table has potentially many orders, and the orders table has one customer. So a moment ago I said that these two relation definitions are optional, and a little bit later in the video I'll show you the situation where these become useful. Now there's one other subtlety in this schema file that I want to point out, and that's this import statement up here. These imported functions are getting used in the schema definition, and I want to point out that these functions are specific to Postgres, as highlighted here. So if you're going to use Drizzle with MySQL or SQLite, you'd need to import the functions that are specific to those databases. Now the nice thing about this schema file is that it automatically figures out what migrations to generate based on the differences between the current schema file and the previously generated migrations. So to generate the migrations, you'd simply run this npm script, the generate script. Now I've already run this script, so running it again would have no effect, but let's go take a look at the migration that was generated when I ran this command. So I'll open up the drizzle folder, which contains the migrations, then I'll open up the SQL file right here, which is the automatically generated migration file. The contents of this file should look pretty familiar to you if you know SQL's data definition language. It's basically a series of SQL commands that create the customers table and the orders table, and it also sets up any constraints and indexes that we defined in the schema file. To execute this migration, you'd simply run the migrate script, which I've already done, so I won't run it again. There's one other file I want to look at before we start writing some queries, and that's this db.ts file here. This is the file that instantiates a Postgres client here, then we're creating a Drizzle instance here by calling the Drizzle function and passing in the client and the Drizzle schema we just looked at. Lastly, we're exporting the Drizzle instance so that we can use it in other places, like this index.ts file, which we'll use right now to write some queries. I'll start by importing db from the db file, then I'll import the customer and order schemas from the schema file. The first query we'll write will insert a few customers into the customer table. Okay, so how do you perform inserts with Drizzle? Well, if you know how to write an insert statement in SQL, you pretty much already know how to write an insert statement with Drizzle. For example, here's the SQL syntax you'd use to insert three customers, and the Drizzle syntax is very similar to this. Let me show you. So I'll say db.insert, and I'll pass in the customer schema, then I'll call the values method, and I'll pass in an array of objects where each object represents a customer. Now if you compare these two snippets, you see that the syntax is very similar. Okay, I'm not quite done with this query yet. I'll call the returning method, which will return the newly inserted customer, then I'll store the result in the constant named new customer, and I'll add the await keyword because this query is an asynchronous operation. Now I'll log the new customer constant and I'll save the file. To run this query, I'll run the dev script by keying npm run dev, and check this out. We see three new customers logged in the console. Okay, so how would you do an update statement in Drizzle? For example, let's say I'd like to update the customer with my name so that it includes my middle name. So how do we write an update statement with Drizzle? Well, as you could probably guess at this point, the syntax is pretty similar to SQL. So here's the SQL syntax to update the customer with the ID of one, and now I'll show you how Drizzle syntax is very similar. So I'll say db.update, then I'll pass in the customer's schema, then I'll call the set method, and I'll pass in an object where the key is the column name, and the value is the new name. Then I'll call the where method, and I'll pass in the condition that the customer ID is equal to 1. And to use this equal function, I'll import it from drizzle ORM. Next I'll call the returning method, which will return the updated customer. And I'll store the result in a constant named updated customer, and I'll add the await keyword because again this query is an asynchronous operation. Lastly I'll log the updated customer constant, and I'll save the file which will automatically run the query. And as you can see, the customer with an ID of 1 now includes my full name. So as you can see, Drizzle's syntax is pretty similar to SQL. Next we'll look at deleting a customer. 
So how do you write a delete statement with Drizzle? Well, pretty similar to how you'd write it in SQL. So I'll write db.delete, then I'll pass in the customer schema, then I'll call the where method, and I'll pass in the condition where the customer ID column equals two. And then I'll call the returning method, which will return the deleted customer, and I'll store the result in a constant named deleted customer, and I'll add the await keyword. Lastly, I'll log the deleted customer, and I'll save the file, which will automatically run the query. And as you can see, it ran without error, and we see the deleted customer logged in the console. Okay, so we've looked at how to insert, update, and delete rows with Drizzle. Now let's start to look at reading or querying data. So let's say we'd like to select the customer with an ID of 1. Here's the SQL you'd use, and now I'll write the corresponding Drizzle query. So I'll create a constant named customers, which I'll set equal to the result of awaiting the query db.select from customers where the customer ID equals 1. Next, I'll log the queried customer, then I'll save the file which will run the query, and there's the result we were expecting. Now, one of the nice things about Drizzle is that it offers end-to-end -end type safety. So for example, if I hover over the customer, we see its corresponding type. Okay, but what if we didn't want all the customer columns returned? What if we just wanted the ID and the name? Well, to be more selective, we can pass an object into the select method, then we can specify the columns to return in this object. So I'll say return the ID from the customer ID column and return the name from the customer's name column. Then I'll save the query, and as you can see, the query only returned the two columns we were looking for. Now, I want to insert a few rows into the orders table so that we can do some joins. So I'll insert these three rows, which gives us some data to work with. Now let's say we'd like to query all the customers in the customer table who have orders. So the SQL to perform this would look like this, and the Drizzle equivalent query would look like this. So as you can see, if you know SQL, you kind of already know Drizzle. Okay, but what if we wanted to perform an outer join? In other words, what if we wanted to return all the customers with or without their associated orders? Well, we just changed the inner join method call to be a left outer join method call. And if we look at the results of this query, we see customer number one with its three orders. Then we see customer three, which has no orders. Okay, but what if we wanted to do an aggregate query? For example, what if we wanted to select the customer ID and the count of how many orders each customer has? Well, I'd simply change this query to include the columns I want in an object passed into the select method. So I'll pass in an object, then I'll say to return an ID column, which has the value of the customer's table's ID, then I'll return a count column, and I'll import the count helper function from Drizzle ORM, then I'll call the count helper, and I'll say to count each order ID. Lastly, I'll call the group by method and I'll pass in the customer's table's ID column. Okay, now I'll run this query and we get the result we were looking for. The customer with an ID of three has zero orders and the customer with an ID of one has three orders. Now there's one other way of performing queries. It's what I'll call the non-SQL way of querying the database. This method of querying data is a little more like other RMs. Let me show you. So I'll write a new query where I set a constant named result equal to the result of waiting on db.query.customers.findMany. Next I'll log the results. And as you can see, this type of query works as well. You remember earlier in the video when I was showing you the schema file and I mentioned there were two optional relationship definitions here? Well, these relationship definitions are used in this style of querying. So if you wanted to query the customers table and include the orders, you'd modify this query, passing in an object to the find mini method, and I'll say with orders, which I'll set to true. Now, if we save the file to run the query, we see the customers and their related orders. So I generally prefer the SQL style of querying, but this style of querying has its place. Okay, hopefully this has given you a taste for using Drizzle. Now there's one final point I'd like to make about Drizzle, and that's the fact that every query you write in Drizzle will result in exactly one SQL query, so it's efficient, and it's less susceptible to inefficient queries that plague many other ORMs. So if you're working in TypeScript, and you need to interface with a database, you should strongly consider using Drizzle, as it's a pretty solid option. Okay, thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.